Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Cecily. I am part of the Bus Boys and Poets Books team. We have a fantastic evening ahead of us. We are joined by Dr. Randall Jelks discussing his book Letters to Martin with Professor whoop, I'm so sorry, with Professor Daryl Scott. I'd like to thank you guys for joining us today. Hello. 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 All right. So I'm gonna get off screen and let you guys do your thing. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is wonderful. This is right. Yeah. yeah. Introduction. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can pretty much introduce ourselves yep. as as a duo. Folks may have, well, folks have no reason to know that you and I have known but not known each other for about 25 years, right? <laughs> yes. Is that about right? That's yeah, right. We, we have this little Facebook presence and we have a relationship to an organization, the Association for the Study of African and uh, American Life and History, uh, where we've both been members a very long time. And so like a lot of people who are academics and go to conferences, we know each other like that, getting chatting from time to time. But we, We've never been running buddies, but anyone who follows us on social media might have thought we grew up together on the south side of Chicago, went to the same schools, played with the same people, belonged to the same gangs and things like this. And so they might have thought that, you know, we were, were tight like that. But it's pretty much a performance on social media. But having said that, over the past dozen years or so, we have had so many intellectual exchanges that I have presumed to know you. Yeah. Yeah, well, I I, I know you. You went to Hills, uh, Francis. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and you went to South Shore. So that means we really do know each other, right? Uh, we, we do gentlemen of a certain time and place, right? That's right. That The, the <laughs> South Side of Chicago uh, just sort of breed uh, uh, intellectuals, right? And of a, absolutely, of, of a of a different sort, though, right? Right. We, right. We're a little bit more gritty than some some folks, right? Correct. And with the outside <laughs> politics, all of the same characters. We, in in essence, we did grow up together because in essence, we know the same people and the That's right. the same uh -oh. intellectual sources of. But, but, but we probably ran away from different gangs. <laughs> I ran away from the Blackstone Rangers. And I ran away from both the Blackstone Rangers and the Gangster Disciples, right? So I was <laughs> in the crosshairs. <laughs> yeah, well, I was in the crosshairs. That's absolutely right. So you had one end of it. I grew up on what they call the low end. You grew up on the south, what we call the uh, far south or the south shore. So that was yeah. all different back in those days. And so we would tease each other about stuff like that all along. And, and you know, but it's been surprising how, how many people I have known who have gone to get their PhDs, who are from the South Side during our generation. And then I would not have predicted that. Uh, so, you know, it, it speaks to, the, maybe just speaks to the fact that there was a million Black people on the South Side of Chicago. At one time it was a million Black people, but also it speaks to the intellectual uh, culture there, there, so uh, I grew up the first half of my life in New Orleans, but s Chicago has a different intellectual milieu. And I want to always say that, uh, that even uh, working class uh, people at Valois Restaurant on 53rd Street uh, mm -hmm. are going to ask you about what you're reading, what you're thinking. Right. And it's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a different place. Uh, living near Kansas City, I really Mm -hmm. You never get that same kind of vibe that Chicago has. And it's that's that's what makes it special, even today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. So but you know, and but now we end up being pretty nitty-gritty intellectuals, right? And that, that right. seems to be part of it. But let me tell you this. I'm telling you what I learned about you, thinking we know each other. I learned I did not really fully understand that you are a minister. I didn't I get a, that. Presbyterian I, clergy. That's right. I and I just thought you and I were historians, and so, <laughs> and so I want to well, tell the people. I want to tell the people this that I, I agreed to do this as one historian to another, and I was lured into this by a guy, a cat pretending to be merely a historian <laughs> to find out that I'm dealing with a minister here. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, there 
there are lots of ministers, and I, I, so <laughs> I ain't putting them television ones. Uh, <laughs> well, now, um, see, see, cats like you used to kick me out of religion class. I went to the Catholic school, and I always got kicked out. But the ministers never liked me. The people who walked well, in like the talk. priest probably didn't like you because you didn't obey, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> <That's laughs> no, I didn't obey. <laughs> but, but, but you know, so it, it's still the case that every time I get around somebody, a uh, uh, a person of the cloth, I kind of get a little. You know. Oh, well, look, I'm a person of the cloth who worked on the South Side, worked both politics and community organizing. I am not that person. You know. Okay. So, now, I, I worked in Woodlawn, bro. I worked in <laughs> Woodlawn. But now I want them to, this is not idle conversation, people. I mean, it sounds like it's idle conversation because the book that Randall has written here. It is not a history of Martin Luther King. This is literally, and he calls it a meditation, which was my first clue that this was kind of religious as opposed to a reflection, right? So it's letters to Martin, meditations on democracy in Black America. So it's meditation. This is Reverend Dr. Randall Jelks talking to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. See, this is different from, this is outside of my wheelhouse. I was being accused of being a public intellectual. And I said, well, you know, I talk to the public, but it's about history. I'm an expert. So I have, I have license to talk about what I study. But public intellectuals talk about things at large. And so here I am talking at large because I'm not really talking history. I'm talking to a guy with a historical sensibility, having a conversation with another minister. OK, so that's what's going on in this book. So it's going to be really of interest to people who are of faith reflecting on the past and reflecting on Martin Luther King. So anybody who has a sense of themselves as a as a Christian and a historian and someone in the black experience, this book is a wonderful book for you folks to read because it really does take us back and forth between today and the 60s through the eyes of one minister talking to another minister. Is that fair enough, Rand? Uh, that, that is the, that, that's the first interpretation I've gotten like that. So it, each each conversation I've had about this book, I, 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 I get a different angle, but that is actually an accurate, one accurate portrayal. I would, I would say that, uh, that the, um, the, my own sense of, of, spirituality, as I call it in the book, comes out of my Christian experience. But I don't reduce it to that because like Bishop Tutu, I don't think God is a Christian. I, I think that if there's a divine, it is much larger than anything we can imagine. So I I would say, yes, I think that's really interesting uh, interpretation that you have uh, of this. Okay. So, so, so the Reverend Dr. I, Jill. I talked to another clergy. Okay. And he didn't bring that up. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, pastor of University Church High Park for Chicago Seminary Co-op. He brought up something different. So yeah, I think you're you're right. Oh, oh yeah, I mean this. Well, for me, the, the clues to this. Okay, I mean first, you know, as a kind of parochial historian, anyone who talks about love and history, <laughs> right? You know, they're doing mm -hmm. something a little different, right? And and so like I, you know, historians can deal with love. But that's a certain kind of discourse. But so this is a discourse in which, of course, it's steeped in King, and this is how I recognized it, right? I recognized it because, of course, I've read virtually every major work by King. There may be something that escaped me, but I've so I read the major works, and King could oftentimes do that. And sometimes I would wonder why he would couch everything in religion, and he didn't just couch it in the people's religion. In a way, it was kind of highbrow religion like you would expect from a theologian, right? He was a theologian. I, absolutely. So the two of you are theologians. <laughs> yeah, I, I never think of myself as a theologian, but I do think of myself uh, thinking uh, deeply ethically about these things. So social ethics is a you know part of it. But I don't mm -hmm. think of myself as in the traditional sense of being a theologian. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I... I uh, uh, I think that theologians try to do one thing. And one of the reasons I drifted to history or moved to history was because I kept feeling like theologians were 
uh, so lofty that it wasn't grounded in anything. Oh, well, yeah, that, then there's that problem, you know. <laughs> it was like, oh, really? Come on. <laughs> but but having said that, sometimes I wonder, you know, this whole discourse that you have with King, and, and again, please, no one has an idea if they haven't read the book. Set out what you do in the book so that people can understand what's going on. So what I what I set out to do with uh, in, in this book, I was asked by Elmhurst, uh, University uh, to go out and um, go out and and give a talk, uh, a King Day talk. You know, mm -hmm. King Day and Black History Month. You know, we get called. That's right. <laughs> right? We get called so, six weeks of Black History Month. That's right. <laughs> so I I I, um, I went to Elmhurst in 2017, just shortly after um, uh, Donald J. Trump was inaugurated inaugurated president. And I'm like, what am I going to say to these kids that yeah. are going to make sense about somebody who's been dead over 50 years um, about, uh, that's relevant to them? And so I, I wrote my, the speech in the form of a letter, and, um, and the, the kids seemed to gravitate to it because unlike our boomer generation, they're, they, they feel, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and <laughs> so I wanted to write something intimate so they, they could feel. And all great writers write make you feel, right? Mm -hmm. and Tony Morris and Baldwin, when you read them, they make you feel. So I was like, okay, let me write something in that vein. And even clergy, you, you're supposed to make people feel something, right? So I, I set out to do this. But I was thinking about the problem of democracy, Daryl, really. And I, what, I had been reading a lot of stuff by historians, intellect, intellectual historians, um, and it seemed to me that a point of view about democracy was missing, uh, and that was Black people's point of view. Now, Eddie Glaude had written a book called Democracy in Black, mm -hmm. and I wanted, I was like, yeah, well, there, there needs to be more discussion about that, because as far as I know, no people in the United States, may, maybe Indigenous folks, but we've struggled to have and make an inclusive democracy <laughs> it, it, since there's been in the United States. So mm -hmm. I will really reflect about that mm -hmm. and personalize it. So I said, well, let me continue these uh, efforts at uh, meditations. Now, meditations, Daryl, let me let me just school you. <laughs> see, see, I need to be schooled. All right. Meditations come in all forms. It's not just Christians. I mean, Marcus Aurelius, certainly, you know, the Caesar uh, wrote meditations. They, you, you know, reflection about taking a step back. That's what I meant. I wanted to take a step back and put some context and put some visual context and a little bit of history in there because I think people operate so ahistorically, so uh, out of uh, context. It's uh, so trying to bring bring that and do the these these personal letters to King. And my experience with King began in the sixth grade. And that's what I write in there. And it, it um, I was in, still in the South in an all black school and and uh, people who thought we were going to lead the race. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for those people, but uh, right. you know, I'm grateful for them. Uh, and my my sixth grade teacher made us listen to um, the day after the funeral, King's funeral, we had to listen to all of his sermons. I mean, every one of them. And they had an impact on me. And I, because I was trying to understand the ways uh, that he sort of had a, his own social analysis. And so that's that's how this book came into being. Okay. Now, you do, you do talk to King. I mean, you, you know, he doesn't answer back, you know, I'm kind of grateful for that in a way, you know, he doesn't answer back. Sometimes, you know, he's, he's very patient listener. <laughs> and of course, oftentimes I would wonder what would he say in response to, to what you were saying? But I mean, so what we really have here is a conversation, a one-way conversation in which you, you deal with some issues that King dealt with or in, in some cases, in some you think he necessarily wasn't very uh, conscious about, and, and you reflect on that. And, and so you have a conversation, it's almost like you're wondering, you're telling him about things that have happened since he's gone, you're asking him about things 
that he did in his life, uh, engagements that he had, there's criticism of King. And so there's a way in which you're engaged in the life of King, but at the same time, one can almost argue that King becomes a prop, right? King becomes a prop for you to talk about issues that he dealt with that you want to deal with, right? That we deal with. Uh, yeah, that we. Yeah. Like, okay, well, okay. I'll put myself I, in it. I'll put myself in it. I, 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 agree, okay. I agree. I agree with you. Uh, yes, he is a prop of a sort, not a not a, a stick stick person. No, no, not a stick person. Right, but but he is a prop of a sort because I needed to look. Whether we like it or not, he is still the giant of the civil rights movement, right? He's he's the only one got that monument in in, in your in DC, yeah, uh, yeah. and um, he, so he it's the voice. He becomes the and he won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, uh, and so I wanted to say, okay, let's have a conversation. Uh, 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 about him, and not write it in the as beautifully as uh, Taylor Branch wrote all of those volumes. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, um, beginning with uh, uh, you know, I, I can't even think of the first volume. That, in, 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 so all I don't know them in order, but the great. Great. so uh, all of that just to to get at at the ways we are thinking about. Uh, King and I wanted to make King black because mm -hmm. I think he gets he's not from black Atlanta he's from Atlanta he's mm -hmm. from he's a, a, a great American but all of his senses about democracy and his instincts are quite black and I wanted to write about that and have a conversation about that and maybe force black people to have a conversation about how we understand democracy, because clearly we're at a state and time when um, uh, that's a global question, uh, and we should be at the vanguard of that. We should, but but you know, one of the things that strikes me about your book is that you seem a little worried. Worried not just for democracy writ large, you seem a little worried about the state of democracy or the love of democracy among black people. Am I, uh, am I right, right about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I, maybe because my childhood was spent with grandparents in the South, I actually learned a lot of democracy from them. I mean, they were Baptists, so you know. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and and that really meant something to them. That was something <laughs> very, very, very important to them. Now, I didn't grow up, I grew up close to the most Protestant, close to Catholic as you can. I grew up Lutherans. Yeah, you I saw that. Saw yeah. that. And, and I thought all Lutherans were black because I lived in the segregated world. There were five all black Lutheran churches, and that's who we associated with. And that's why uh -huh. black people were everything. You know, my neighbors were Catholic, my grandparents were Baptist. Uh, you know, uh, I just thought in a town like New Orleans, it was cosmopolitan black people. You had black people from everywhere. So I just thought black people did everything, you know, from owning the cabs to, to owning mm -hmm. the insurance company. I thought black people did everything. And so I, I really, really, learned a, a great deal of democracy from my grandparents. So, you know, I once asked my great aunt, <clears throat> why in the town of Wilson, Louisiana, where my Jelks family is from, there are two Baptist churches. Well, you know, they had a split. And, <laughs> and, and you know, Second Baptist is where the Jelks went. And, you know, and, and, uh, and, but it was all done. My grandmother, who had a fifth grade education, ran meetings using Robert's rules of order, her deaconess meetings were tight. She was mm -hmm. known for running a great meeting and even sitting ministers down saying, no, you cannot interject here. I just learned this sense of cultural democracy from various black people. Um, and I think that's lost because sometimes we lose our institutions. I don't say you have to be a Baptist. I'm just saying 
that we I worry about the loss of institutional life. You and I share this. Yeah, we share this, right? In a way that 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 shapes 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 us and uh, our communities and how we discuss things. One of the things you, that people forget how democratic the Montgomery bus boycott really was. I mean, they had folks had to vote on, you know, the next mm -hmm. act. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but then you know, but there's also this authoritarian tradition in the oh. African American community, right? So we're not a mono tradition people, as right. you know, and and so how, how do you see that that pendulum swinging? Are we, well, uh, I I see this pendulum swinging is because you know you got people wanting to tell uh, others what to do. We we have to accept our own pluralism. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that 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 is a must. We have to accept within our community we're pluralistic. I mean, look, all black clergy, you know, these are my people. You know, I I heard a lot of that on the South Side. These my people. I was like, oh, really? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm you know, I'm here. I'm the pastor for life. Uh, stuff uh, when I was doing doing work on the South Side. Oh, like really? You know, and sometimes these people were the head of a Baptist church, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> That's right. But there were always going to be fighting. People are going to split and go start another battle. But you could split to the point that you could be a, your own authoritarian in a small enough church, That's right? right? Some people <laughs> were uh, authoritarian, you know, but then people got tired of that. They left. <laughs> That's right. It means you, you could end up with a, being a church of one, right? One. So, well, I, I've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> so, my way the highway, and it's just me on the highway, right? <laughs> It, unless we explore historically, mm -hmm. and otherwise our own democratic traditions, black people have to explore that in a way to so that we can theorize how we should govern ourselves. And I really want to, I really want to get us at to the, the point of thinking about how we govern ourselves. I just, I always was taught again at home. That you know, you we govern ourselves. You know, segregation's out there, uh, racism out there, but we govern ourselves and, and our institutions. Now, one of the interesting things that you you say, uh, you distinguish what you're doing from procedural democracy, right? And I must confess, you know, I'm pretty much a proceduralist, right? I'm a you know, just these formal, inclusive, who can participate operate through the structures and the institutions. But there's something more that's going on with you and, and with King. This is why this reflection between, uh, conversation between you and King matters and that you're both ministers, is, is that this conversation is about the, the what, what one might say is the content of democracy. And another way of putting this, maybe you accept this, maybe you won't, is that you seem to fill democracy with a lot of Christian content. Well, As, and 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 it, but I, I mean, I mean, first let me say, not narrowly speaking, right? Not narrowly speaking, but it seems to me that there's some kind of religious ethos, right, that you see as part of democracy, giving it a certain kind of content that maybe. People or other faiths would, would agree with, but it still seems to come from a very religious place, right? Oh, Is that I, right? I, I would say, look, I'm a Presbyterian, and that means something, right? I mean, that actually means something. You know, Presbyterians are these damn Calvinists uh, who believe in procedural government. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at the very core, if you ever look at the Presbyterian Book of Order, it's a law book. It's not. I mean, it's a law book. I mean, it's a. But but it had that law book has to be filled with some 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 commitment, whether it's emotional commitment, whether I call it spiritual commitment, some kind of commitment, so that we agree that these laws that we make in common, that we respect uh, one another to carry out. Mm -hmm. What I worry about is that there is no emotional or spiritual, uh, uh, even spiritual content to to carry out these laws. I, I I'm I'm dumbfounded uh, how much in the uh, the in the, the academy which you and I share, how little respect for procedure 
there is. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Here are the very people who will, who will cry democracy, democracy. But if you don't have a, uh, the best I can name it is some kind of spiritual commitment to democracy, it, 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 it seems to me it's just a, a facade for power. Yeah, I mean, it, it, Brian, I think you're on to something. I mean, particularly about the academy. The, the academy is now mirroring things in the larger society that we are opposed to, that the people in the academy are opposed to. But I see a lot of the, uh, uh, I'm just going to say it, I see some Trumpish tendencies in the academy. At this, at oh, this absolutely. Point. If we take Trumpism to be something other than uh, democratic and inclusive and procedural and so forth, you know, we the guardrails seem broken in the academy a lot. Right. So, right. So those, yeah. yeah I, 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 and it's not just the academy, it's just the way we treat people and negotiate uh, people. Um, uh, um, and this is the kind of leadership. But the whatever you have to say about those Puritans, and those those other people who pilgrims, they did set up a procedural way of operating um, that we we have to keep examining. It's not mm -hmm. perfect, but it protects us. And what, you, wait, 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 but don't you, do, you, do you know how volatile that statement is that you just made? Because you know what you're really saying is. The Mayflower is still relevant. <laughs> they, they, they are. I mean, the, the, Jonathan went, went through it. <laughs> talking about his own people. I, and I wouldn't get that twisted at all. But the the you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Some parts of that of way community has to operate is good. And some people just want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, the, the, those English white people coming to America. Well, we need to we need to examine that because they were yeah. they were leaving yeah. a monarchical. I'm going to stir it a little bit more, and this is going to go back. In other words, people like King, and and the whole tradition that you know much better than I do, the black theological tradition. You know, they accepted as part of what was there. <clears throat> inheritance, this whole religious set of thoughts and practices and, and how it shaped the culture going back to day one. Okay, they accept that this is part of their world, right? They didn't try to pretend that Black Christianity somehow starts with Jesus and skips all of the European experience, right? Right. <laughs> okay, so, so this whole inheritance was part of theirs. And when LeBron Bennett says we came before the Mayflower, he didn't was not saying the Mayflower was irrelevant, right? right. He, he wasn't saying that. And he wasn't saying, you know, that the black church is a development that comes out of slavery as, a, as if to say that the whole country is a story that takes place and unfolds in Virginia, right? right? Okay, and so even though, you know, historians can have debated what's the role of Virginia versus the role of these greedy capitalist slaveholders in Virginia, you know, what's the role of all these things? We no one would say, and so some people throw it out. Even worse still, there are people who say it was never that relevant. Okay, and that's to me, you know, throwing out something because you reject it is one thing. Okay, not fully understanding how much of it is part of you is yet another thing. It's almost a form of denial, right? Yeah, it, what I'm trying to, to to get at is, yes, we have part of our culture is civil religion. Mm -hmm. uh, part of our culture is that, and we need to look at what what's the good in that civil religion, uh, as uh, and and what needs to be uh, thrown out of that. Mm -hmm. Part of that 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 that's a long tradition. And that's a tradition that uh, David Walker and uh, Jarena Lee and all of these mm -hmm. people that people sometimes name on Twitter posts uh, <laughs> were a part of. They were, they were a part of that, right? They were a part of that. <laughs> and, and the religion mattered. You know, you know, to me, you know, one of the problems I've had with religion is just that I don't, 
you know, I don't, it doesn't hold, doesn't hold in my head the way perhaps everyone's ever thought it should. It doesn't. But I've always understood that that was a shortcoming in me. Okay. That that is part of my shortcoming where other people, you know, can embrace and think in spiritual terms and religious terms much better than I can, you know, I, but, but that, that, that's, so I never denied these things existed. It was just something that functioned better than other people. Right. But this inheritance, right? In other words, that people when they were Baptists knew they were Baptists. People when they were Presbyterians knew why they were Presbyterians. It, you know, but with, but with the slave master would sometimes su suggest say that, or, or just white people who were racist would say that black people, you know, they they just they don't know what they're doing in church. They, these denominations mean nothing to them. But in fact, these denominations most often meant a lot to them. It was just a few people like me who, for whom was like, I don't know what's going on in here. <laughs> they were talking about me in generalizing, in other words. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> you, you, you know, look, look, more people are like you than were like me, you know, like go, uh, going every, being an acolyte and be, all of this other stuff. More people are like you. My More of my family were like you than <laughs> They showed up. They showed up at Easter and Christmas. <laughs> you know, but you know, I just made no bones about it. I hear what y'all saying, but it's just not sticking. It's not holding. And, and, and that, that's what I. That's the wonderful pluralism of black black life, and mm -hmm. I think that that is good because it keeps everybody honest. I I think you keep us honest. I think <laughs> those of us who declare religion. I, I, I don't know, you know, when, 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 when Christian America, and, and by the way, this is something that struck me too. And so I put it in this way. You know, at one point you say Protestantism is the glue to the we. So black identity has as its glue Protestantism. Now, mm -hmm. of course, at the same time, you're a pluralist, right? So you you accept people like me in the mix, in which I'm agnostic at best. You know, I'm, I'm like a social Christian. I'm kind of, and more precisely, I was socialized awfully Catholic. Okay, you know, so I know I can't escape that Catholic culture, right? But but you, when you say we're a Protestant, we you know you're the New Orleans guy. You know, as you stated, that this is a very diverse community we belong to. But you still say Protestantism is the glue to peoplehood. Explain that notion that we're both diverse and Protestantism, which would include Catholics and Jews and and, and Muslims, but Protestantism is our glue. How do well? How yeah, that we can't, but I I would argue, Daryl, that. Just historically, I would argue that the translation of the English Bible, the King James Bible, is as important to Black people as anything because it gives it gives us a national sense of identity at one time. Now, there are many other identities going along with that, um, mm -hmm. you know, alongside. I don't see people. That's why I wrote a book on live religion. I don't. People have things that go side by side with one another. You know, mm -hmm. my, my same Baptist grandmother say now, you know, Reverend Johnson could preach a sermon, but he can't heal his knee. I got to go over there to the hoodoo lady to get my knee. And I'm going to go over to the Catholic church on the, on the, get, on, get my fish on Friday. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the way I saw it, but what I meant by that that statement as a as a gluing statement is is the language of that is the the language of democracy that we use in mm -hmm. in, in the United States and, and and by the 1830s when lesser known slave ships lesser number of slave ships have come black people had pretty much used turned to that language the language of Protestantism in the in 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 the the English Bible. Uh, English translation of the Bible uh, at that time to formulate their critique of American society. That's what I mean by the glue. So uh, okay. David Walker, uh, uh, others are making, making, making arguments uh, that are very much like like that. I mean, and 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 even black women internally are making that same argument with black men inside their institutions. 
Okay. So now, one of the things that you do in this book, um, you you seem to you seem to use King. One of the ways you use him as a prop is to get to the uh, to the gender question. Okay, in 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 the history of blacks and democracy, right? Yeah. And so, you know, without you know, say more about that. Tell us more about that that history and how that trajectory has been, how it's changed, and what it needs to be. Yeah. Well, I I wanted to talk about the gender issue, but for labor to relationships, right? I mean, uh, uh, people throw out about. Martin King, he had relationships, right, with uh, women out other than Coretta. I mean, mm -hmm. that's in the movies in Selma. And that's a great scene in Selma. Uh, actually, one of the better scenes in, in that film. But but the, the the question is, King had a lot of relationships with women. And so I want to start off with his, his grandmother, his mother, mm -hmm. the ways that the, the other kinds of relationships that his sister uh, we mm -hmm. he had a sister. He graduated same time. Uh, she graduates from Spelman. He graduates from Morehouse. All of those, all of those, all of those are relationships. And I wanted to get at that that he's a generation. Uh, the book is dedicated to two of my uncles. In and um, and. <laughs> they were men of their time. They were men of King's time, and I understood their world. I didn't always agree with it, uh, but I understood their their world, and it was pretty sexist. It was damn yeah. sexist. <laughs> yeah, it was damn sex, and um, and not not pretty sex. And so I wanted to get at, at that 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 was his time. Um, we don't have to agree, and we need to expand our understandings of what constitutes families and what constitutes a love, uh, because that's the things we we've evolved and learned. Um, so I, I really wanted to get at that and not all, not the, the kind of salacious part, because one, King was never at home. I mean, the dude, you know, um, you know, David Garrow, the, one thing he does right in Bearing the Cross is give you a chronology of this guy is, you know, packing up his suitcase to go somewhere else every day. I mean, yeah. and I, and it's a miracle that he and Coretta had four kids because, you know, I mean, it's uh, because he's gone all the time. Right. And that has to put strain on a relationship. And how do you have a relationship in public? And this is the thing. What's the separation of private and public? All of those kinds of questions that I just thought it would be an interesting way of, of asking that question. And then I, I tried to examine labor because the question of labor is, uh, how we actually work uh, is uh, is as much about women uh, as it is about men. It's always been that in the black community. Mm -hmm. Daryl, do you remember all the black women went to work in your life? Ooh, yeah. Every everybody, right? So oh yeah, every, everybody. All the women went to work. Yeah, and and yeah, yeah, absolutely. I right. mean, <laughs> so the question of labor. Although I, I I hear a lot about the feminism of representation, but the question of labor is like, I still see black women at the Walmart, black women at the at, 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 at the Target, at the grocery store. So when we talk about labor, unless we dignify women's labor, we can't dignify the whole community's labor. That's and that's what I want really wanted to get at it. Like labor. All labor has dignity. Yes, it does. And we need to think of it, even those fast food workers, because, you know, I was asking my friends, why aren't you commenting on the fast food workers? Because when they went on strike in, in Chicago and other cities, because mm -hmm. majority of them are women. It, and, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, but Randall, there's something about this when you start the, the whole part about dignity of labor. It seemed to me that you're not. You think virtually everyone, including Christians in a way, don't really believe that they give lip service to the notion of dignity of labor. So what's the state of the dignity of labor with, 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 within Black democracy? Well, most Black people are thinking about that everybody's going to be a professional. 
It's gotten there. It, it, that's right. And, and, and in fact, that anti Booker T. Washington swing, right? It, 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 it transformed your school, right? Yeah. I mean, if it, you know, let's, let's roll this for people. I mean, this to me is a very fascinating story, right? So I went to Hills Franciscan, and you went to what school? South Shore High School, baby. Went to South Shore. Okay, you didn't go to CVS. No. But you you were not far from CVS. No. Okay. And so when Chicago vocational. Chicago vocational. So all the vocational schools in Chicago and around the country, right, when we were coming up, they were under assault. Correct. Right? They were under assault because they were teaching trades. Now, one of the things people don't know is that, you know, I'm kind of like you got a, a whole bunch of working class skills that I have personally accumulated, despite the fact that I've gone on to get a Ph.D. And one of the things I did, I went to see I went to Dunbar High School at night when I was in high school. I didn't know that. Mighty, mighty Dunbar. Yeah. At night and, and to take a class uh, to learn how to be a tailor. So I, you know, I, so I picked up part of the skills I picked up was tailoring at the, you know, at the very end, you know, the James Anderson critique of the trade I was trying to become a tailor when, when, when the tailor, you was trying to be Steve Harvey's tailor. <laughs> That's right. But when this, but when this, when, when this was at the very end of the thing, yeah. but the war against that, but part of that seems to be a statement in which the dignity of labor is is under assault because we we thought you were nobody if you were just simply it seemed that we were saying you were nobody if you were picking up a trade. Right, right. Well, I, the dignity of labor it seems to me that people always emphasize, you know, being what we are college professors, and I'm grateful to be a college professor, no doubt about it. But I've come from working people, and mm -hmm. they, they work with their hands. They work, you know, they carry luggage. Uh, they cleaned up houses. And the, the dignity of labor means that, well, then we have to find ways of creating ways that they can speak back to uh, uh, bigger organizations. So... Dignity. I'm with King on that. Labor is important, and labor unions are important. Uh, and ordinary people have to be able to speak back to big institutions that attempt to exploit them all the time. But you know what? What also seems so relevant in that chapter that you were talking about labor and King, and that this has to be part of of, of the content of our democracy, if you will, is that. King understood what was going on with the loss of, of, of skilled labor with, through automation. And that, so then when, he, when he's down there in Memphis, he's talking about unionizing people that years earlier, no one would have thought about as a kind of primary population to, to, to try to help in unions, right? I mean, sanitation workers, you know, that's not the high skilled job. That's a low skilled job, right? And so then, okay, but he saw that that was the future. And when you, and, and that, that we would be in a lot of these service sector jobs uh, that are not part of the kind of quote unquote productive side of society, not making goods, but, but providing services. Now, here we are, 50 something years later, and it seems that that's still where we are needing to unionize. Those folks, by the way, as well as professors, <laughs> right. because because the lack of unions means that we don't have a pension system in the United States anymore. Uh, that people are uh, the as wonderful as four ones may be, they're not going to secure you uh, in one way or another. And uh, we have to be concerned if we are concerned about people's lives. And we have to be concerned about their work and their everyday work. And, and when they get old, like we all are getting old. I mean, when, when you get old, you, you still you have to have some kind of something to lean on. And pensions have declined uh, precipitously because the middle class thought, oh, you could do away with unions. And they were. And now, you know, doctors need to be unionized. I mean, I mean, physicians. as oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, and and you know, and and thank goodness the teachers have a unions. Obviously, teachers. I don't want to characterize them as weak, but the beatings that we put on teachers it would be much worse if they didn't have unions. I mean, Correct. the way society is, is treated teachers. So, you know, as we we move forward in this society, uh, everybody. But I mean, but some would have predicted in a way that globalization would eventually bring the world back around to where you you could unionize. But it, it, but it means, in a scene, maybe that's what's happening now. I'm no specialist in globalization. In the state of the world. Well, that's you what know. Marx believed. You know, I mean, Marx believed that, you know, eventually, you know, the communists, we, we, we're going to all be, the proletariat would unite across the globe. You know. Well, I mean, again, without even uniting across the globe, I'm just simply saying this division of labor that people saw 30 years ago. Remember when the quote unquote Chinese, when the Chinese were supposed to do the quote unquote unskilled work? Right. <laughs> okay. But it's not quite happening that way. But in other places of the world, the capital could always move faster than people can organize. It's something to that. But at the same time, it does seem that people are waking up to the need of unions again, particularly where people where, where corporations are very vulnerable. And it does seem to be that the service sectors are more vulnerable than we would have thought, that there would be surplus labor. And right now is this moment uh, when people have figured out that if they can withdraw from the economy, they can do better. Right, right. Well, but but that can't last forever. So you need some kind of organization and structure That's right. to face up to. And these are the kinds of questions that I really want us to be talking about. I, I think we are. I wrote this book for black people. I, that was my primary audience. Um, maybe I hope everybody reads it. But mm -hmm. I'm thinking about who I'm writing to. And even when I'm thinking about when I'm writing actual, uh, the kind of chronological, th theoretical history, I still think I'm writing to Black people. Uh, I'm still thinking I'm having this conversation with the people on the South Side, the people in New Orleans, uh, the people uh, in, in these various communities. I'm having that conversation. I'm, I'm trying to take it up to a higher level. <laughs> That's why I'm having that conversation. <laughs> Randall, uh, sometime at one of our future wine old parties, I will have to disabuse you of that idea and give you some details on how I learned that my, my, my intended audience doesn't care that much about what I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, oh, I think actually, I actually do think they do. Just that they have to, you know, be introduced to it. I mean, it, again, you talk about going to Dunbar and night school. But where are the night schools anymore? You know, where, yeah. who who can't wake up till three o'clock in the afternoon? Well, you know, the good news for everybody in that regard is, you know, I'm, I haven't done this yet, but you know, you can pretty much go if you want to do tech stuff. You can go to school very cheap at any time to pick up certificates and 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 change your life. I mean, right. again, an empowered person who has a certain level of skills can, can do that. We're not talking about people trying to acquire the basic skills, but it is certainly a world in which we can all uh, kind of diversify our background. Right. And, and, and the power of YouTube University should not be underestimated. It is amazing. It is. It, it, it is. Well, Daryl, in, in reading the book, I, you, you are asking me the questions that I wanted to that's why I asked you to be an interlocutor because I wanted to have these kinds of discussions with people around this. Uh, I I don't care if people agree with me or disagree with me mm -hmm. or my assessment, but we need to have these discussions and we have to have books that are that lead to discussion and and have conversations about it. And I've been surprised how. Uh, many uh, people wanted to discuss this book. I just got off uh, the other day with the Texas NAACP. I was so wow. surprised. Uh, and, and they asked a different, they were asking all the political questions that, that the book ra raises. They're Absolutely. Like, well, you know, this is a great book. I'm telling you, you, you hit on something here, right? I was thinking about this today. Um, you have a book that's going to be viable for more than a decade or more, right? What, what I'm saying is that it's tied to King and it's tied to some perennial questions. 
And it's a book that people can read. You did. You were right. You you wrote the book at my level. And you jokingly say anybody can read it. You did. You wrote it at my level. South Side boy who barely could understand theology and religion could read it and get something out of it, right? And so I, my kid, come on now. Let me tell. No, I'm telling you, they threw me out of class every year. Everywhere I went, they threw me out at least once a year. Right on that. He was asking those hard historical questions. No, I just did that. I did, you know, I, and so <laughs> they would throw me out. But but the point is that people can can read it and engage it at various levels, and and it's tied to King, and it's good that it's tied to King, and so. People want to discuss it. So you'll be able to do this at a kind of grassroots level, uh, small audience level for and, and medium audience, but I mean, for a very long time, yeah. which is which is great. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh Kay, Kay Whitehead asked me, why didn't I write to, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer? Why didn't I write to uh some other other figures in in in, in, in the movement? And I'm like, but Kate, none of them got a monument in Washington. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, you, you know, I mean, personally, I would have loved to write to Mary McLeod Bethune because uh, I think she's one of the greatest unsung leaders of Black America ever. But, but you have motivated me. Maybe I'll write one to Card you Woodson. Most people, oh, I don't know if they can see. And you see my Woodson picture up there, but I should write one to Carter G. Woodson. Uh, because it is, it, you know, I mean, how many times have I talked to this dude? <laughs> I've talked to this dude a whole lot. <laughs> so, you know, so I really need to 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 open up this possibility as well, you know. I, or, or, but the way I feel about it is I'd have to write a report to Daddy, write a report <laughs> to Carter G. Woodson. Oh, yeah, Woodson was a tough, tough character. Um, <laughs> I have to explain myself. <laughs> Oh man, he he's he's pretty. I, I, I but this is a good idea. In other words, I think this is a great exercise for a lot of people to, you know, yeah, write letters to people that historical figures that they identify with, and in, in that way, you can have this conversation past the present. Uh, it's useful. It's yeah, very useful. You know, uh, one school teacher uh, suggested to me uh, that that she wanted to get her students to write a letter to King about what they thought about mm -hmm. today's, today's world. Um, and the, the other side is there, I hope there's so much uh, moaning about, I, I hate to put it this way, but there's so much moaning about and not working at um, what needs to change. Um, it's something you, you said some time back, you know, that, the the, the the classist people uh, knew poor people better than we know poor people today. Oh that? yeah, and oh, I, yeah. I, <laughs> absolutely. And, and you know, I would uh, I would challenge us to to think about that. We've got to get to we have to organize our own community anyway. It, it's, 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 you know, we you, you know we, American society. We, national idea that's why you know uh we give it up to you know barack obama when he was in office like why he was a politician he needed to be held accountable yeah i mean but we think I mean, this is a very interesting moment right it's almost as if we have been fully incorporated to the point that the national institutions are our only institutions Correct. And what's the, the tragic part of that, of course, is that that means there's been a breakdown in civil society. And this is why we perhaps are on the brink of, of fascism. And so then without a robust set of institutions in society, you could be in trouble. But for Black people, this lack of institutional strength in our communities and and we know that it was the church is the rock, but there've been other institutions. They've been much stronger, yeah, before. Too, yeah. and much stronger before. And we're paying a price because institutions like the NAACP and the Urban League are not as strong as they used to be, cool. and that we didn't create other institutions. So if we didn't like the NAACP or the Urban League, maybe we should have built something new. But but one of the things that I'm you know, and I'm a little outlier on this one. I don't think this dem this hyper democratic 
we don't have institutions, or should we say everybody's a leader theory of, of movements. I, I think that that has not served us well. I mean, it, it takes away from accountability. It may preserve the struggle in some kind of minimalist way, but it doesn't give you the day in, day out responsible leadership that you need. You know, SCLC, you know, may have been made up of all those ministers and did not have the youthful enthusiasm and the lack of structure that some people felt SNCC had. But SCLC waged the fight year after year successfully. So the question gets to be. And gave the money to start SNCC. It gave the money to start SNCC. That's right, that there's something to be said about institutions and this lack of strong institutions. We're paying the price with disenfranchisement right now. Yeah. So we should ask some questions. Uh, yeah. Turn to the audience. So sorry, we're at 53 minutes or whatever. So are there questions? Yeah, I was waiting for the questions to appear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you say, write that out, right, Sylvia? Okay. <laughs> yes, we, 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 I would like to read it too. Yeah. <laughs> well, Oh. <laughs> okay, I might have hit on something here. Right. Uh, well, Woodson, Woodson, Woodson wasn't wasn't uh, your warm and fuzzy guy. So no, he wasn't. But I got to write a report. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be a conversation with Woodson. I'm gonna I'm gonna submit this seeking his approval. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, well, whether whether it's letters to Woodson, but here, in, in in this sense, there is no king without Negro History Week. Right. The, the, all of these people are formed by this. These these the, the, you're speaking of institutional builders. All of these people are formed by this, and in in the association for the you know study of Negro life in history. Right. And king read a lot of that stuff. You see it in his sermons. Uh, you see it in his uh, his uh, correspondence. Uh, his uh, now, they, Woodson taught us how to think historically, um, and you know, we I could have wrote a whole chapter on that, the sense of history, uh, because that's Absolutely. the that the 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 we we young people. What, what scares me is may, maybe. I had Clementine Skinner as my, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, principal who was a member of this association, and you know, she she put into place Black History in, at South Shore. That was one of the great things that we had. Now you couldn't take it till you were a senior. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, what is the most uh, surprising reaction that you've gotten from uh, the book? Oh. You know they're they're all different, and it's that's the interesting thing about these discussions. Everybody brings up something different, and I, I that's in the, the most enjoyable thing. I mean, um, th that people when I was talking with the diverse books and the NAACP, they brought up the politics of the books. I mean, how how do we manipulate? And I had to just remind them that this is not new. Um, Anybody who studies Southern governors knows what we are facing is not new. No, that's right. <laughs> um, and so then what is the, how, how we organize has to be new mm -hmm. uh, because we've let, like, like you said, many organizations go down the hill. K King could do his thing because the NAACP was doing their thing and doing and it, you know, the NAACP was getting people out of jail, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we need we need that, uh, and we forget that. And there's too much. It's too much uh, stardom uh, today. And, you know, I want to write a book because I, I fashioned myself to be literary, and and so I wanted to write something that is interesting and literary. Uh, and that was the fun part of this for me personally. To write a, a a book that that had pretty words, you know. I, uh, when I was at Michigan, I had Harold Cruz 
as my civil rights teacher in the novelist Gail Jones. And I was, and Cruz was a failed playwright. That's why he was so grumpy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cold. That's cold. But that's, it's true, but it's cold. <laughs> but, but, uh, it, it, it's, it, I wanted to write something that people could read and think about and debate. In, um, and it comes out of my experience. Um, and I am so ever, I, I didn't never get to tell my sixth grade teacher or the people who took me to the King grave site, thank you for all of those things. But that's in, in one way, that's a ode to them. Um, and my grandparents who, I mean, they tried to keep dignity through all of the Jim Crow era. People for, think that black people just submitted, they had to deal with it, but they were dignified people. And that's something I learned. And, and I think that we should appreciate King alongside so many others, because we know the hi real history, it ain't about one person. It's like King said at the Nobel Prize, said, I accept this for 64, what, how many, that we're not, not 64 million Negroes, but whatever, how many Negroes he was accepting for, he was accepting on behalf of. And that's 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 the real history there. Well, okay, but Rudy has a question for us. Okay. What do either of us see as being the future of black intellectualism in the world? Well, What's the future? You know, Gerald, you know, remember I was in the Czech Republic. What struck me, what struck me is how many people I had a I taught a class as a full I had a cushy Fulbright. I was a distinguished scholar. Good for you. And I taught this class. It was oversubscribed on, on African American history in the 20th century. It was literally oversubscribed. And the people of the Czech University was shocked. And students remarked to me how much they thought that the Velvet Revolution uh, uh, had learned from the Civil Rights Movement. Um, I think we have a global power that we don't exercise. Uh, I really believe that that it's Black people's democratic struggle is that what people resonate, resonate with all over the world. Um, and we should, we should learn about other people's struggles, uh, but they also want to learn about us. What The other thing in the Czech Republic, I hung out with Roma, the gypsies, a mm -hmm. lot. And they're Man, they're getting rousted by the police the same way black oh, yeah. people. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So it, they were like, hey, tell us how this, ha you know, how does this work? Yeah, but, but this is a, this is an interesting question because you, you, when we talk about intellectuals, of course, there's always intellectuals. And I tell people all the time, some of my the best, smartest intellectuals I've ever known, I knew before I went to college and when I was in the Army. But trained and elect is still a special kind of thing, okay? And at this moment in history, we have so many people who are very systematic in their thinking, organizing their thinking, who play with ideas, who look for solutions, that we have an embarrassment of riches. On the other hand, we have a neoliberal system, right, which is a one percenter system, a star system, where talent is basically filtrated, not necessarily for the most rigorous thinkers, but for the most entertaining people. Okay, this is my critique of the public and electoral. And what I guess I'm saying is that we have a lot of people with a lot to offer the world, but yet because of the filtration that goes through our media complex, the people who come out speaking at large are just not a good reflection of the talent that's out there. And there has to be a way in which we can get this more democratized so that people who are addressing problems and issues in the Black world can talk to one another and each other and the rest of the world more effectively. But this, this once again, is about those institutions. Well, I'm, I'm going to say something controversial here, mm -hmm. and that is when I, when I learned from reading the other person that the book is uh, dedicated to is Lerone Bennett. Mm -hmm. And you got to write well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a journal editor 
of an academic journal and uh, whew, we can't write people confuse jargon with writing mm -hmm. and, and you know being jargon this is not good writing um mm -hmm. and du bois was the first one that whatever you say about him you know sweet willie could write uh and he made it plain too yeah yeah that's right i mean he was always accessible right Correct. And we have people who like, because that's the language that they use in the academy, but I think mm -hmm. it's just terrible because it doesn't communicate to people on the street. People could read the crisis of the Negro intellectual and argue about it at the barbershop. Yeah, because he could write and he made it plain. Right? Right. I mean, yeah, but we went through this thing in the academy, right, where where intelligence seemed to be measured by the, the density of prose, okay? And I won't name the name. He's a very famous intellectual. When I first started reading his, his work, I won't name his name. Don't, you never get it out of me except offline. Uh, that, you know, you could see that, that this person was straining to sound as profound as he possibly could in every word. And, and we, we're taught that in various disciplines, right, to demonstrate that we belong. But on the other hand, Randall, you know, having said that, there's still a lot of people who are not well known publicly, who are vying to even be public electors, who do write plainly, but they can't break through this system that just wants to winnow everything down to three or four different personalities. Well, well, it, it, it's easy to categorize that way. Yeah, uh, yeah. And we are, and it's easy. And of course, we don't, we don't have a Johnson Publishing Company. I'm not talking about Ebony. I remember the publishing company. Yeah. In, in the, so, oh, damn. So it's how do you think uh, existing institutions can be strengthened? Uh, some young, talented leadership, <laughs> I hope, will go into them. <laughs> but you know, but it's, Audrey, I'm just going to tell you. So you got to, you, you have to, you, you have to, you, that you have to have a sense of calling about these things because they, <laughs> but, you, but but you know I'm going to tell you this other side. This is nothing romantic about. There's nothing romantic about an ex, making an institution, existing institution, and strengthening it. That's a big fight. I mean, <laughs> one would argue it's better to create a new institution. But yes, we do need to strengthen existing institutions, which means young people need to be able to go in them. And recognize that nobody's trying to yield to you. See, this is what you care. I left because they they didn't want to hear anything from me. Yeah, yeah, I know that's right. That's how people are in institutions. They are very conservative. And if you want change in an institution, you're going to have to fight for that change. And it's not going to happen in five minutes. Okay. So you really need to know you're going fighting. But you can also start new institutions. That's the beautiful part of this thing is institutions are not serving your needs. Then you find like-minded people and you create new ones, right. okay? And, and to address the problems built for the future, not built out of the past, right? Right, and, and, and that built for the future is going to be a past sooner. So so <laughs> it's going to be a past too, right? And you find yourself preserving what yesterday's radical ideas, right? Yeah, that's, right. that's correct. <laughs> that's, but yeah, I think if those existing institutions, and we always have to fight for young new ideas in it. And, and as old heads like me have to keep opening doors to mm -hmm. young people in those institutions. Okay. So Ryan, I don't know, they gave us an hour and we're over that hour. How are we supposed yeah. to do this? Are we supposed to, are somebody gonna come cut us off? How does uh, I don't know, but it, anyway, well, first of all, Daryl, thank ah! you for the conversation. <laughs> thank you very much. All thank right. you. I enjoyed it. Yeah. It looks like we're being cut off. <laughs> yeah, see, I didn't want to, I don't want to over abuse my time. You know, the, we get accused of things like this being academics and, and you being a minister, you know, we know you never want to stop. <laughs> uh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. That's me. I didn't unmute myself. <laughs> I said, uh, I think I'm guilty of just enjoying that conversation. Far. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Stop it. <laughs> it was very, very inspiring and very informative and a little bit spicy. I had a great time. I hope everybody else enjoyed it too. Well, come to one of our wine old parties and you'll get better. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we'll certainly take you up on that invitation. Thank you guys so much for joining okay. us this evening. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye bye. All right, everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed the talk as much as I did. Please stay warm and stay safe the rest of this evening and join us soon again for our next event. Bye bye.